the Treasury Board. Um, we work for Alex, who you just heard from. Not directly for Alex, maybe like six, seven levels down in the big government machine. Um, but we are the operators of open.canada.ca, Canada's open government portal. I'm joined today by my colleague Matt Cullen, who works on the team at Treasury Board with me, and our great development team from StatsCan, uh, Will Hearn and Salman Jeffrey, um, who are going to talk to you about the technology. I'll start quickly um, giving you a little bit of context. So in Canada, we coordinate our open government activities uh, through the Open Government Partnership. Canada joined the Open Government Partnership in 2011 and we launched our first national action plan in 2012. Um, the goals of the partnership are to promote transparency, empower citizens, fight corruption, uh, that type of thing. It's, uh, there's 75 member countries now and there's also membership at the sub-national level. Ontario is a, a member of the Open Government Partnership as well. And uh, here's our plan. So uh, we commit to doing a biannual plan to look in government partnership every two years. Um, we have 22 commitments under four big categories. We have open by default, fiscal transparency, innovation, prosperity, and sustainable develop development, as well as engaging Canadians in the world. Um, and this plan is available on open.canada.ca for anyone to take a look at. Next, I'll talk quickly about the Directive on Open Government. So you heard Alex talking a lot about policy, that type of thing. The Directive on Open Government is our main policy tool that we use to advance open government um, and open data within the Government of Canada. It has the objective to um, maximize the release of government information and data of business value to support transparency, accountability, citizen engagement, and socioeconomic socio benefit through the reuse of that data. So, what is the Open Government Portal? Uh, generally, it, the portal is two websites. There's the Open Government Registry, and then there's the public-facing website, open.canada.ca. Um, op the portal is a one-stop shop for information on open government and open data and information. It was launched in 2011 as the, uh, oh, launched, sorry, launched in 2011 as data.gc.ca as a pilot. That's what it looked like. Some good uh, CLF for you. It launched with 780 data sets plus the holdings of the federal geospatial platform. Um, in 2013, we relaunched under the current look. Um, and it's structured under three pillars of activity. There's open data. This is where GC Government of Canada departments and agencies can submit their data via the self-serve interface, the registry and Canadians can search across all available data sets and download the data in machine readable and reusable format. Um, we have open information where users can search Government of Canada publications and unstructured information resources and um, this currently provides consolidated access to publications from um, Public Works, PSPC, and um, from Library and Archives Canada. We have open dialogue. This brings together a number of related activities, including our blog, and we do consultations on there um, around open government activities. I'll do a quick tour uh, through the site. Um, just a bit of background. The front end is built on Drupal 7 using the Web Experience Toolkit, which uh, Will and Solomon are going to get into a bit more. Um, the back end is powered by CCAN, and the search is solar. This is a popular technology stack for open data implementations. Uh, this stack is in use by the UN, the UK, and the European Data Portal. Um, I'll show you a few features, but obviously I don't have time to get into every aspect. So let's say we navigate to open data. Uh, you can see, you can view departments' data inventories. We require all the departments to do a list of what data they have and what could be made available to the public. We have open maps, um, we have an apps gallery where we feature applications built by the community that use our data. Um, so let's say we go to open maps, you can uh, go through, you can search, um, and you can select any type of map that's available and uh, view it on a map uh, with different layers. So you can 
This is where you can put different data, different maps on top of each other and compare, which is a cool uh, visualization tool. Uh, next, I'll go through a data set. This is what a data set would look like on the portal. Um, you can see, you can search by facets, that type of thing. If uh, we pull up a data set, you'll see it has you know, a bunch of metadata. Um, you can download the data set. You can switch it to French. <laughs> um, and you can also comment and rate data sets. When you comment the data set, uh, when you comment on a data set, it gets put into a publishing queue where we review it and make sure that you know people aren't trying to troll us with a bunch of inappropriate comments. Next, I'll get into the Open Government Registry. This is where uh, Government of Canada data owners go to add and modify their data in the Open Government Portal. Um, generally, the, the registry only houses metadata, uh, but for some things, we have the ability to host it. Um, and we're going to be working on building that out more. So I'll walk you quickly through the steps it would take to publish an information resource. So you just go and open information. Um, you would, again, you see a bunch of metadata elements that need to be filled out. Um, and then of note, you'll see um, two metadata elements that are particularly important. The first is IMSO approval. So in the government, we uh, make departments get approval from the information management senior officer of the department before they publish a data set. This makes sure that the data is not going to be in violation of the Privacy Act and that it's not some sort of confidential information that we don't want out to the public. Um, you'll also see the ready to publish uh, element. This allows departments to load something into the registry and keep it as draft and then they can publish it when they're ready. Um, and then this is the steps you would take to, to actually upload a, a resource. You go in, um, fill it out, and then the main thing that I wanted to highlight here was that for the most part, you have to have that posted on your department's web server and you put the URL in there. But in some cases, like I was saying, you can actually upload the file. As the operator, one of the, my first thing I do when I get into the office every day is I check the publishing queue. So we're responsible to do the QA to make sure that whatever departments are publishing meets our standards, making sure that it's available bilingually, making sure it meets uh, web accessibility rules. Um, so I go in in the morning, I check, you know, say, oh, the new Jack consultation, whatever that is, is in the uh, queue. I would go in, uh, look at everything, and make sure it's good to go. So next I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Um, welcome to Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Um, so I'm here today to talk about proactive disclosure, to try and contain your excitement. Um, basically, there's a few reasons I want to talk about it today. Number one, it takes up a significant portion of our um, open information uh, section of our site's information that's released. Um, it's also great for the conversation today because Will, Herod, and team have done a significant amount of development work for proactive disclosure over the past two years. Um, so it's a timely uh, discussion point. Um, and also, it's, a, it's an issue that's of strong public interest and high visibility in the media, um, and rightfully so. You're dealing with tax, you know, releasing information to taxpayers. They want to know how their dollars are being spent and where. Um, so just a, a brief description of what it is. So departments are mandated to proactively disclose information on a quarterly basis for contracts over $10,000. Grants and contributions travel and hospitality expenses, um, position reclassifications, as well as acts of founded wrongdoing. Um, so why do we want to centralize? So for the last year and a half, I've been working or leading the initiative to take most of the, or all of the Government of Canada proactive disclosure information from the 90 some odd institutional pages and migrate it to the uh, centralized Open Canada portal. Um, for a lot of organizations, as you can see there, um, proactive disclosure content takes up to sometimes 80% of their uh, information on their institutional page. Um, so it's quite substantial. Um, with that, you can imagine how it dilutes the content, both for internal and external searches. If any of you have tried to go on government pages in the past and look for anything, 
you notice it's quite difficult to find what you're looking for, um, and that's part of the reason for it. So this would definitely declutter a lot of uh, the internal pages for sure. Um, it creates a heavy management burden for organizations to create and update and archive all this content. Um, another thing we did when we did an environmental scan about what departments were releasing uh, as far as proactive disclosure, there was an inconsistency across what elements. So some departments were reporting you know, three details about a contract, some 20. So we needed to standardize that process. Um, another thing it required a mix of manual and automated publishing processes from the organization. So it was a heavy infrastructure burden for the government of Canada. Um, so by centralizing, we'll uh, alleviate some, some of that once the uh, servers are decommissioned. So the benefits, um, pretty self-explanatory. Having all the content located in one system creates new opportunities. Um, have a single searchable interface for all Government Canada data. The interface provides facets uh, for common data elements, so your organization, the month, the year, the dollar value. The will will go through some of the uh, screenshots of this work later on, so you'll get an idea what that looks like. Um, the data is automatically transformed into a downloadable data set, which is updated daily and made available to the public. So before, if you were looking for information, you were going to one website by one, trying to get that info, um, whether it's crawling the website um, or scraping it. Now you have one easily downloadable CSV. You can uh, manipulate that data however you want. And we're starting to see more and more companies use that. Um, simplifies the data management across uh, the government of Canada. So the same scheme and tool are being used for all PD types, which standardizes the reporting process and elements. All departments are now reporting on the same things for all types of proactive disclosure. Um, and the common platform makes it easier for all proactive disclosure types uh, for, for web publishers. Like I said, if they're uh, eliminating 80% of their workload by not having to publish this on their institutional pages, and we're doing that for them, that's a significant savings of uh, time and, and money. So where are we now? So the past two years, TBS has been working with uh, proactive disclosure policy owners and departments to standardize these reporting elements. Um, as with any enterprise government uh, action, it's, it takes time. Um, so we have created a GCPD page with all of our training sessions and supporting documentation for users. Um, where it's currently over 50 institutions publishing disclosures to the portal, and we're working towards centralizing, uh, making that reporting mandatory. Um, there are approximately 300,000 disclosures available for, for users today. Um, and departments have reported back the centralized system allows more subject matter experts to have improved control over their reports and leading to consistent internal and external reporting. So you can imagine how much easier it is for a user to go into our registry, update a file immediately, whether it's a, a deletion or modify it, and it's published right away as opposed to sending that to their web group, which probably has to go to their comms team, you know, all for it could be just a little dollar value uh, error. And where are we going from here? Um, so departments can continue to onboard. We're working towards improving the data quality. Um, that's one of the things that's been lacking. Uh, we can do this through validation and standardizing our templates, which we are working on. One thing that's of note is that there are currently proposed amendments to the Access to Information Act that's with Parliament that could vastly widen the scope of proactive disclosure reporting. So right now, 91 departments are mandated to report these disclosures that I discussed earlier. With the new amendments, if they're approved, um, it would widen the scope to Minister's Office, the Prime Minister's mm -hmm. Office, Crown Corps, um, Court Administration Services. So you'd be looking at about between 250 and 300 deport departments that are now required to report. In addition to the size, um, the scope is changing. So departments will be re required to report on mandate letters, briefing binders, briefing note titles. So the hope is, and, and I think we're going that way, is that our portal will really be a one-stop shop for all of the information and data that departments are, are, are going to be mandated to release. Um, and it's kind of timely that we're, we're talking about today because these changes could see significant opportunities for Drupal developers, so a lot of people in this room. Um, as we're moving forward, we're going to need to expand our site, our reporting capabilities, and uh, improve our overall UX for, for all of our users. Um, so that was it. Thanks for your time. We will get into the more technical portion of it after, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about how um, the drivers of all the work that they've been doing for the last year or so. And we'll be here for the rest of the day, so if anyone has any questions or wants to chat about getting any more information on this topic, um, I'm happy to talk. Thanks. So I'm going to jump back into the site here. Um, on the Open Government Portal, we feature our analytics. Um, we like to display our analytics publicly so anyone can go on and see uh, what information is out there and how people are using that information. 
Uh, currently, we're only reporting on a limited amount of information because everything is done manually. Our dev team is uh, populating a spreadsheet with the data and our web publishers are adjusting the numbers, um, but we're hoping that as we uh, move into Drupal 8, we can get uh, more automated with this functionality. Um, quickly, what do we have on the portal? You know, hundreds of thousands of records. Um, you can see uh, proactive disclosure, what Mal was talking about, is a huge portion of the content, um, but we also have, you know, thousands of other data sets available. You'll see uh, in purple here, 540 open by default working documents. Um, that's sort of an interesting thing that I'll talk a little bit about more. Next, I'll get into some use cases. This is where I get excited actually about open data. What are people actually doing with the content? So one great example um, of a Canadian business that's making use of our data is the Montreal-based firm Local Logic. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with the vendor or the company a few months back and I found uh, what they're doing to be super interesting. They're sucking up data from a ton of open, do uh, open data sources to develop ratings on neighborhoods. Um, they license their software to realtor.ca, so if you've ever uh, been looking for a house, I'm sure you've been to that site. If you click on the neighborhoods tab, you'll see that they are, they're rating neighborhoods on a number of uh, factors. Um, one specific information where they're using our data is they're taking uh, data on how much railway traffic is on train tracks close to there, and they're using that to uh, contribute to the noise rating of the neighborhood. I found that super interesting because for us, you know, we put a lot of content out there, but it's rare that we get to see uh, what people are actually doing with it. I'll get into a couple other interesting use cases. Um, and one of the ways that we discover how people are using the data is from the questions that they ask us. Um, and they won't necessarily be direct questions, but you can kind of get at what they're doing. Um, so we get you know, hundreds of emails a week, and normally there's one or two that make you think, wow, like someone's really using our data for something important. We get a ton of inquiries from financial services firms. Um, one example that I thought was interesting is a hedge fund contacted us looking for, for more detailed information about traffic on Highway 407, which is a toll road. Now I thought, why would a hedge fund want to know about that? And I looked into it, and I was seeing like, oh wow, Highway 407 is run by a Spanish company called Sintra, and the 407 makes up 33% of, of their revenues. So, you know, if you're a hedge fund deciding, uh, am I going to invest in this company or not, you can see why the Highway 407 data would be super important to making that decision, which I found uh, super interesting. We get a ton of other questions from uh, big industrial companies. Uh, we got one from a solar power company who is looking for more information about solar irradiation rates. I mean, I know nothing about this stuff, so we hand off those questions to the data owners, but it, it makes me uh, happy to come into work when I know that I'm helping Canadian businesses uh, move on with what they're trying to do. Next, I'll talk quickly about open by default. Um, so maybe most importantly to this crowd, open by default is our first production Drupal 8 site. Um, and what it is, Open by Default is a website where we feature work in progress documents from government and Canada employees. So you, you heard Alex talk a bit about um, you know, trying to open up and be more collaborative. Um, and, we're, and this is one way that we're trying to do that. Currently it's in the pilot phase, but uh, the end state will be people who are using the government of Canada's records management system to manage their day-to-day -day documents. In that um, records management system there will be a button, and it will be a share to the world button. Um, and there'll be, you know, a technical stack that takes that document and pushes it out uh, on our portal to share with the world. Um, which is, you know, a really big culture change for departments. Next we'll say, where are we going in the near term with the portal? Uh, first, we're going to get to the cloud. Uh, currently we're working on on-prem infrastructure, but uh, we're hoping to move to the cloud in the next few months. Uh, which will, you know, dramatically reduce our run cost as well as provide us with more flexibility to be able to start hosting more uh, assets so that departments don't have to host it on their own uh, departmental web servers. Um, the other thing that we want to get to is visualizations. Um, we would love for people to be able to, you know, manipulate data, throw it on top of other data, put it into cool graphs, that type of stuff directly on the site without having to download 
and then do that type of stuff in Excel. One of the challenges we have with that is accessibility. Uh, you know, how do you make the alt text work properly so that it's accessible? Um, that's, you know, a challenge, um, but we want to get there. And uh, you'll see from Will later on that we're moving to Drupal 8. And then one last thing uh, before I hand it over to Will that I wanted to talk about is what are, what are, what are some sort of leading edge applications in the open data world? One thing uh, that the U.S. government is doing that we're not doing is co-locating their data sets uh, where people are trying to do cloud computing. So when you're trying to work with huge, like data sets of huge uh, file size, like satellite imagery or uh, DNA genomics data, it's super difficult to download and transform that data and then analyze it on a desktop computer. Um, so Amazon is actually partnered with the U.S. government to host popular data sets for free in their cloud so that their cloud compute clients can have that uh, data co-located with uh, their cloud compute workloads. I think this is super interesting. We're not doing it yet, but uh, this is something that we're going to be exploring uh, as we mature. Uh, Will, I'm going to hand it over to you, man. Awesome. <clears throat> We were tasked with uh, creating a 10 to 15 minute presentation to demonstrate the work being done on the new open data portal powered by Drupal 8. Um, honestly, there was a lot to learn, far more than I initially uh, expected. Um, however, with the fundamentals of dependency injection, service containers, plugins, API, etc. in hand, one soon realizes the sheer power and versatility of this platform. Uh, as all of our stuff is online, is posted, we've Ever since the beginning, we've started coding all of our things on the GitHub Open Data repo. Everything you see here, you can entirely leverage yourself, see how we did it, and just go through a repo and help us uh, improve it. Okay. Introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Did you introduce yourself? Oh, that's okay. It's the next slide. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to keep this presentation brief, so I can more freely engage with the audience, answering questions, highlighting code. Uh, this is the following agenda I'm going to go through. Uh, I'm going to talk about installation profiles, the specific OD components, and then take your questions. Um, so, hi there, my name is William Hearn. I'm a technical architect at StatsCan. I've been working with the amazing Drupal community for about a decade now. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, additionally, I credit Drupal with getting me involved in other areas, such as containerization uh, in general for app delivery. Think Docker, Rocket, OCI, and orchestrators like KH, Tectonic, and Nomad. Uh, of note, we currently use containers for our developer environments, private GitLab, GitLab CI runner past the government firewall, and even public testing infra uh, via Travis. Uh, Simon's just going to do a quick introduction to you. Hi, my name is Ramon Joffrey. I'm a developer at Coalfront Labs, um, and I've been working with Drupal for the last three, just over three years. And uh, for the last year and a half, I've been a developer at StatsCan. Um, I've been working on both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, at least for the last eight months. I've been doing exclusively Drupal 8. And uh, you can find me on Drupal.org as sjpeter79, uh, on the Slack group, Drupal Slack group as the same moniker, and uh, uh, we contribute regularly to both Drupal.org projects and on GitHub and GitLab. Okay. All right, profile inheritance. Uh, before we get into our sub-profiles and how they work, this is some, a concept you'll need to, uh, to understand. Profile inheritance allows you to customize the installation process to meet one or more of your specific needs. You can both inherit and override configuration from the parent profile, as well as add or remove dependencies. Additionally, you can run additional installer tasks per profile layer for further customization needs. If you're interested in leveraging this outside of the open data context, take a look at this Drupal D.O. issue number, which is currently in needs review and likely to be landing in Drupal Core 8.5. 
All right, um, so Lightning. Lightning is a top distribution in Drupal 8 backed by Acquia, allowing you to build experiences quickly using the best of Drupal 8 in a feature-rich, extensively tested, and secure open source distribution. Lightning powers uh, huge sites such as Princeton, Tesla, and uh, the upcoming new Pfizer redesign. Uh, it also includes powerful notable distributions like OpenEdge, Thunder, and Demo Framework. Uh, there's four key functional areas that are targeted by Lightning. It's one is layout, which is drag and drop layouts to configure page layouts with drag and drop tools. Media management, embed images, Twitter, Instagram, um, videos, and more from Drupal or other sources directly into the content pages. Finally, we have workflows, which is configure workflows that keep content moving through review and approval stages easily. Also features improvements to the native penalizer experience. And then finally, they just recently added this, API first. Lightning ships of several modules, which together quickly set Drupal to deliver data to decoupled applications via a standardized API. Uh, basically, they come with JSON API, simple OAuth, and uh, open API. Of note, um, are you worried about the workbench to content moderation update path? If you're using Lightning, that they're taking care of that for you. That's why we're using it as our, as our base framework. So now we get into WXT. Um, let's go to the top of my slides which uh, extends off of Lightning through sub-profile inheritance. Uh, I just wanted to mention there will be a WXT exclusive talk at 2.15. Uh, so lessons learned. Built with lessons learned from Drupal 7 wet kit in use by several departments, including the open data portal, um, one of the biggest decisions was deciding to leverage Lightning as our base framework. Uh, this choice wasn't made careless, carelessly, but six months in, I can say it's been an incredible time saver, allowing us to more readily focus on departmental customizations. Uh, so with Lightning, we, we know that updates are extensively tested upstream. Maintainers are cl incredibly collaborative. I encourage any Drupal.org to get in touch with Fina Proxima, Balsama. They are one of the best Drupal, the, the best Drupal developers there, there are, and they just want to improve Lightning and make it the de facto framework to choose. Um, it provides a great testing suite with custom BHAT step definitions, even so you can actually drag and drop your layouts and that's all coded in BHAT and you can, don't have to write your own for that. It streamlines the panels, panelizer, C tools workflow, it increases the developer pool, um, and it gives me more time to focus on WXT specific issues. So WXT, following the practice of Lightning, WXT tries to keep its scope minimal and ensure when functional, functionality is added that it can be easily disabled. WD, WXT Extend is a wrapper module which enables more advanced functionality and gets enabled during a call, an install callback, so in your sub-profile of WXT you could easily opt out. Um, all the various WebBow themes are supported and can be toggled in either a minified or non-minified mode. Um, improved layouts. We integrated with Bootstrap layouts, which extends from layout discovery and core and gives us impressive grid control and to support many types of layouts. We are slowly moving the layouts from the official IA spec from GOC. Uh, finally, WXT and Bootstrap library, given in the spirit of modularity, just in case someone didn't want the full weight of a distro or lightning, we have made it so our just our theme, WXT Bootstrap, can run on its own without any other dependencies other than WXT library. You need that because there is still some constraints in Drupal 8 where you need a module to implement some things due to theme system limitations. But you just have WXT Bootstrap and Library, that's all you technically need to run it just with native core. And we've also ported a variety of WXT plugins, uh, tabbed interface with a media entity slideshow, lightbox gallery as field formatters, uh, share this page as a custom block type, etc. Um, right now, uh, various sub-profiles have been created against WXT as the stats can, um, encouraging us to not create monolithic sites. Um, so finally, this brings us to open data sub-profile of WXT. Um, importantly, this profile must run in a Postgres-backed environment, so all modules have been ex extensively tested against. It features a variety of improvements, whether across the data modeling layer to all the way to the template layer. Uh, the main goal was just a straight port of the legacy Drupal 7 site, but there has been a great deal of improvements made to the portal. I'll be highlighting a selection of the various uh, improved components in the bulk of the remaining slides. Uh, it's not going to Unfortunately, this isn't going to show as well as I wanted it to, but if I hover on open data, this gives you a nice dependency graph. Uh, yeah, it's not. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we'll probably explain it. Uh, but this is pretty easy. You can actually just, this is all of open data's components, and then this is all of Lightning's components. And you can see how it, it calls WXT and core, and it shows all the dependencies therein, and this is WXT's dependencies right here. Um, this is just a D3 dependency graph wheel. If you have a, your composer.lock file, you can instantly just upload it. It will generate a nice pretty graph for you, and you can easily see how the profiles interplay. Basically, you can see that uh, uh, what we built 
uh, what we're inheriting from Lightning is quite a lot of different components that are already pre-built, uh, made by a very supported team at Opio. And uh, WXT builds on that, adds a bunch of extra components and fixes, and then basically our open data profile adds a very minimalistic uh, add-on on top of that, just to get what exactly what we need going for open, no, uh, open go. All right. So and, uh, this this, this right here, sorry, no. <laughs> this right here. Oh my God, I actually pre-recorded, so I had to time it. Um, is it playing? No, it's not. Uh, so this is just showing this the front end, nothing too crazy, mobile responsive, and that um, everything is actually ported. Uh, this is a fresh install. We didn't, I didn't do anything other than install and migrate in our content. That, nothing else was done manually behind that. Uh, so just showing the front page layout, uh, the blogs all came in. Um, it's all done via bootstrap layouts and it's working quite nicely. Uh, so then if I go down, this uh, right here shows you, it's kind of hard to make out, but but essentially right now I'm going into our install profile for WXT, showing you that we're calling Lightning as our base profile, excluding some of the Lightning components we don't want. And then we go into um, OD, which you're gonna see is calling WXT. So this highlights sub-profile inheritance. And you can see um, additionally near the bottom, uh, we just added just about a few extra customizations on top of that. And if we go into our profile, you can see we enable our OD extension and WXT extension layer, thus making it so you can opt out in your own sub-profile from any of our advanced custom, uh, custom functionality. Uh, so finally, we're going to go into uh, the OD components, and these are the six I'm going to try to highlight in short order. Uh, the first is landing pages, uh, then search pages with solar, the group module, migration, user engagement, and API first. Uh, let's get my slides back. All right. During the course of the Drupal 7 lifecycle, Open Data has had a repeated scenario of needing to be able to create a one-off page and the ability to, to add custom blocks and position them just for that page. So the layout content are both unique. Lightning provides an improved workflow that is also compatible with deployment. Um, just as a bit of a note, this was uh, solved in Drupal 7 by an over one would say abuse of the, pa of the page manager structure, the page manager structure page. So now it's actually a proper content type and it's uh, helping us with, with deployment and web workflows. So we go down here. It's gonna, how many times did we do it? Second time? Yeah. So this is just showing that all of our pages now are landing pages when they came in. Uh, this is gonna go, we're gonna. Yeah, they're, they're just our content. So this itself is a content page. I can edit its draft, and um, actually only when it's in draft mode can I change the panel's functionality behind it. Now I'm going into some of our proactive disclosure pages, showing that every single one here no longer resides in a min structure pages. It is a pure content type, and with that we get all the benefits that uh, that involves. And this is just showing an example of how the layout system works. Let me do it again. Uh, so we can just change the layout, and you can see we have a bunch of layouts through Bootstrap, through Columns, WXT, we're slowly migrating the official IA layouts. Uh, so I'm going to select uh, the Topics landing page. This is where things get interesting, where you can actually customize the layout a bit more. You can add custom grid options, span-10 for every region or wrapper region. Um, you can make your own templates, like the standard way in Drupal 8, but if you add the Bootstrap layouts class, you instantly get the Bootstrap grid on top of your layouts. So it gives you more flex flexibility when you're creating them. Uh, very, very useful. And this is just managed content so we can easily drag and drop. And we can get content authors to create these types of screens, which is in the end goal of this, is to make it relatively easy. And I'm getting a call. All right, next. All right, so now we have search pages with Solar, my favorite section, my favorite component where I spent a lot of the time. Um, so it's a search API backed, moderated, deployable, panelizer based layouts. Um, uh, compared to the legacy portal, wh uh, whose architecture was around Apache Solar and involved a lot of manual field mappings along with hook query alters, the new search API workflow has been incredibly impressive. Um, so first we have the search API framework. It's the immensely pow powerful abstract framework for creating searches on any entity known to Drupal. Keep in mind that, that little known to Drupal uh, right now, we're going to get into that in a second, um, using a variety of search engines. Then we get search APIs for Solar. It's, um, it basically just lets you integrate with the solar, uh, the, the solar server and lets it power your, your search pages. It's incredibly high performance. You do not want to um, have like maybe views leveraging 200,000 queries and trying to display that. You should offload that to solar and then through views uh, present it. Um, also, it le leverages the Solarium PHP solar client and powers our app gallery site search. 
then this is the new module, Search API Solar Data Source, which is coming in to Search API fairly soon, but right now it's on GitHub, and I've been working with uh, a great developer, Dcam, to get this out. It helps you include content not originally indexed by Drupal. That is amazing. It basically means I can go to any data set and, and have it in Drupal to present it and link it up with views. Um, so it's backed by type data. It lets you search and view external documents and it powers the proactive uh, disclosure in Drupal 8. So we go down. Uh, so this is just showing this. Again, making a second time. Right. So this is just showing an actual uh, grant page powered by um, CCAN, uh, uh, CCAN web service coming to us and then through views and search API, we're just inheriting it. Uh, we can do searches and quick faceting. There is a functionality coming in where we're actually going to be able to Ajax, but we're, there's still a little bug with the show more where it doesn't Ajax that content in. Once that happens, the page refresh will also be gone, so the experience will be uh, much improved for that. Um, then we're just going to go a bit further on. I'm just going to see where I am. Show controls. Let's go a bit further up. I mean, a bit too long. Uh, then you get the point, roughly. Uh, so we have many facets and uh, support for that. If I go down a bit more, this is the back end. So you can see all of our cores are fully mapped. CCAN, API, contracts, all backed by YAML. There is no custom configuration anymore. We could actually do most of this uh, via the UI, which was great. Um, so then if I go in a bit further, I'm actually going on the index itself, just showing how we mapped it. Because we're using Docker, uh, the connection strings are very, very easy for our local environment. Um, then if I'm going to go back and show you what it does when I actually integrate with it. So right now, if I go to processors, you can see that we can do a bunch of extra work on the data itself. Um, and hopefully right after that, yeah. So we can do highlighting, extra HTML filters, basically further, um, further processing on the, in the entries we're bringing back. This is where it gets neat. These are all fields from CCAN right now. So I'm saying these are all from the, the, JSON, the REST API, and I'm controlling um, what type they are. This is also the facets, facets section, showing all the facets we have, how it's all backed up and linked. And hopefully in a second, it's going to show us the code layer. Once I just go through this, sorry, I'll just get the slides to show again, see where we are. Yeah. Uh, so this is just showing the, the, the code structure for all that. It's kind of hard to see, I apologize. But basically it's showing everything you saw is backed in code. Um, I can basically config export this, bring it to production, config import, this all comes in. That's it. There is no like a weird manual behavior for any of this functionality, unlike Drupal 7, where we need to do extensive work for that. Um, now we get to group. Uh, group lets you create arbitrary collections of entities across your site and then leverage granular ACL on those collections. Uh, basically, we're using this for communities and level, level of memberships. Um, so during the post installation, what we did is we ran a migration called ODEXT group, which imports all of the governments of Canada's defined departments as groups from CCAN via the Action API. Uh, with these groups imported, later I can assign content to these groups and basically lock it off so only people in those groups can access that content. So if we go right here, you see I'm going to go very, very quickly uh, to structure migrations. This is just going to show you just the migrations we've done, this migrations. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom on e ODEXT group. Once it loads, yeah. And you'll see we're, we brought in 191 uh, departments uh, through this. I'll migrate makes it, make it so easy because we can just point it to a JSON all in YAML and show the mappings and everything comes in. So we've now got all the organizations coming in. I'm going to go to page four showing that we've mapped uh, content to the Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, so with all this in, once we've migrated in all the blog posts and consultations, we said in the post-process logic that they should automatically become TBS because right now we're going to let them be the gatekeepers for this. You can say they can create a blog post, create consultations because that's what this group has the, the privilege to do. Um, now I'm going into the related entities. You can see we've added all the, these users based on certain roles to the group and we've added certain co blog content to this group so it can be uh, blocked off. Group module is a little bit like OG, but uh, a lot simpler. Uh, now we're just going to go through. Uh, we did migrate all the content from the legacy portal to Drupal 8. This included paragraphs, flags. Uh, we did data model changes. So if ever you're interested in how migration works, take a look at OD EXT migration in our code base. It might help you. Because um, sometimes the Drupal's upgrade, code upgrade from migrate isn't, it's more of a one-to-one -one with just core. But if you need to do architectural changes, you're going to want to do something a bit more custom. So yes, we migrated node, users, menus, taxonomies, media, file entities, comments, blocks, uh, paragraphs, panelizer. 
Um, and this is just showing you roughly how you set it up. You have to declare a new database string saying where it's your, what your um, new database is. Um, ours is PG uh, Postgres, that's how we're migrating it. And then once the mapping's done, all you really have to do is say drush migrate OD external, and then just translation, everything comes in. Um, so this is just, I'll do it again. You've already roughly seen the screen, but it's just gonna, is it not doing it? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is the overall migrations. You can see we brought in about uh, 5,000 comments, 7,000 users. Uh, we don't have as, many, as many nodes. 28,000 web form submissions came in. Um, another interesting thing is we've also in just the OD uh, migration, we brought in landing pages and penalizer pages all via migrate. That's how we brought our state from an initial install to everything you see here. This, as again, this was just an install I did uh, two days ago with nothing done on top of it. Um, so now we go into user engagement. Uh, integration with Flag um, comes pre-configured during the regular profile install of open data. Currently, Flag provides the plus one functionality used for suggested data sets. Um, so you can see here, here's our suggested data sets. What we actually did is, what we actually did is we ported, because this all used to be votes in Drupal 7. So now we said, well, if you're just upvoting and there's no downvotes, this is kind of more of a flag. And this actually helped us further things along, because not everything in Drupal 8 is done yet. So we did convert votes to flags through our migration layer, which uh, was very interesting to do. It wasn't actually that hard. Now we can do uh, comments. You can't really see the, the comments. They have been styled, and they're much more nested. There's a bit of gray. I'm not sure why it's showing. I'm not showing. Uh, then we have our apps gallery, which we've done a, few, a bit more work on. And that all, all this came in through Migrate, uh, so it, again, I encourage you to take a look. And then we just went a bit further, and I just decided to rate, and there you go for the UI components. API first. Uh, so this involves external entities and JSON API, and this would be the last big component. Um, basically, let's look at two examples um, where we are leveraging this functionality. On external entity screen, you should notice that we have um, two types, uh, CCAN and Solar. So we actually made two storage clients that work with external entities. And what this lets us to do, as you see in the slide, so right, right here, basically we're telling Drupal, go directly to CCAN, own and do a, a REST query, and pretend those results back are entities in Drupal. That's right, we're, we're actually making faux entities in Drupal, and we're gonna be able to add fields to them. So right now for CCAN, I did uh, manage fields, I'm going to edit. I'm editing the, the CCAN external type. I've mapped my fields from the de external data set. On the storage settings, when it pops up, you're gonna see, come on. Uh, you're gonna see CCAN storage client pointing to opencanada.ca. Uh, this is our pagination settings. And then we're gonna go to our uh, API key settings, which we have none. Then parameters, oh, I'm just doing a simple test. So give me all query of, of data set. Nothing too, uh, too crazy there. Then if we go back, you can see that uh, solar inventory works roughly the same way. We now have entities in Drupal this is from CCAN. Drupal does not have any knowledge about this. But because they're now in Drupal, you'll notice when I go to uh, page three on the open portal catalog that we can do some nifty things now. And this is how the open by default portal works. I click on the open data portal catalog. We can do comments and votes on external entities that have no business right now being in Drupal. That's amazing, the fact that we can do this. And then through JSON API, this works with JSON API, and you, um, CCAN can then do another query, getting all this stuff back. So we're completely working with CCAN through web services, unlike Drupal 7, where we actually did some uh, database chicanery to make things work. Um, so then that's for that. Now, last thing, we're just gonna go through JSON API very quickly. Uh, no configuration out of the box. If you enable it, it provides a full REST API for every entity type bundle in your Drupal application. Uh, so right here, you can see, just by launch, installing JSON API, it gives me all my all my routes, and you can get anything from them. You can get any comment, any node, um, paginate, do relationships between them. It's quite impressive, and everything's, and it works with default entity um, access. And then this is just showing our postman, and this is just gonna, highlighting how some of our things work. So right now, you can see I'm querying via JSON API, external entities, CCAN. Give me all the external entities that with some CCAN right now. You can see we're getting all the results. Even though it's not in Drupal, I can leverage them as entities now because we, we made them entities through external entities module, and now I'm getting them all back. And then I'm just gonna, and now we can go through, I'm getting the solar inventory to showing how another one works because we had two mappings, CCAN and solar, and it's working pretty great for that. And then in the next section, you can see once it comes up that I'm gonna be querying off of external comments. Fine, give me all the external comments I just made. Uh, so I'll, I'll query that. You can see we can do parameters for relationships right here. And now it's getting us our nice comment that we made. 
um, from an entity that is not really in Drupal. And so this is really great to couple functionality. Um, and finally, because we did do a query external comment, external comment, this means get us every external comment. But what CCAN wants when they load their page is to just get the comment from their CCAN package ID. So this is where we do a relationship. We're saying, based on the CCAN package ID, join back up to the node since we're displaying comments, bring, show up the node too, and then let's just give them the one entry they want. So they use this page to then power their, vote, their, uh, their screen. Finally, we have votes. We're just showing how we get all the votes come in. We can go just vote, vote to get every vote that came in. And then later on, we can go vote by a specific CCAN ID just to get that number, which is quite, quite great. Finally, because we're using the vote module, it has a lot of functions with it, like the vote average, the vote count, and the vote sum. So because we're using JSON API, we can do a, a relationship group query where we can get all this information as well. So you see here, I'm going to hit the params section for vote result. I am saying how, because vote API has this in the database, give me these records too. I need the count, I need the average um, in order to, to give the proper display. So that's how that works. Um, I encourage everyone to take a look at JSON API. It comes with Lightning by default, um, a great module. And I think I'm going to end it here. That's uh, roughly the whole presentation. We had a lot more components, but I was trying to keep uh, everything time boxed. Thank you very much.